From the world of politics to the world of business, this is Balance of Power. Live from Washington, D.C. From Bloomberg's Washington, D.C. studios to our TV audiences worldwide, welcome to Balance of Power. Alongside Kaylee Lines, I'm Joe Matthew. One week to go. The Iowa caucuses are in view, and former President Trump holds a wide lead in polls as the nominating season gets underway. Congress is beginning its return from the long winter break, and new hopes now for a deal to avoid a government shutdown later this month. We'll talk it out with Congressman French Hill of Arkansas. And from those domestic political issues to geopolitics, what are the biggest risks the world faces this year? Eurasia Group is out with its list, and its chairman, Chief Cliff Chupkin, is here with us. So, Joe, much to discuss and noteworthy on the top of Eurasia's list, yeah. the number one risk is the United States... <laughs> versus itself, and that's that just speaks to the gravity of the election year that really we are now entering into. Well, that's right, and uh, we've got one week to go, Kaylee. Mm -hmm. 12 degrees below zero, I think, is the forecast for Iowa. Brutal. A week from today, mm -hmm. when voters will actually begin the process. We've been talking about polls for months now, and we'll actually have voters in caucus sites making decisions in one week which is going to make for a pretty busy week, not only here in Washington, but, of course, on the trail. And, of course, we will be there to cover it fully with special coverage from Des Moines. But right now, we are here in Washington, and we are joined, as always, by our wonderful Bloomberg's Josh Wingrove and Nancy Cook, who cover the White House and national politics for us. So, Nancy, just to begin with you, one week out, Trump is polling consistently around 50 percent, perhaps even north of it. It seems all but guaranteed that he is going to win Iowa. I guess the question is, how much does he need to win by to cement the idea that he is eventually going to be the Republican nominee? Well, his campaign for months has really tried to project this air of invincibility, that they are the front runner, And we have seen that in the polls. I do think that there is a concern uh, privately among Trump campaign officials. You know, they really want him to have a blowout win. They want him to basically knock Ron DeSantis off the ballot. You know, they want to show that they are dominant over Nikki Haley. And, you know, they would like to see him win by as wide a margin as possible. There are two factors complicating that. One, as we already talked about, the weather in <laughs> Iowa a week from tonight is supposed to be super cold. The caucuses start at 7 o'clock at night, two hours after it gets dark. You're asking people to leave their cozy houses after dinner and go to these uh, precincts in snowy Iowa. And then the second thing is Trump has a very large number of first-time caucus goers who are supporters. And so I think that there is a concern among Trump supporters that, you know, some of these people will see the polls and say, hey, my guy is so far ahead, I don't need to leave my house and support him. Yeah. But they really want him see, to, to win by a wide margin. Potentially dangerous. Uh, all the while, Joe Biden uh, is, of course, doing the Rose Garden strategy, even if it is a bit cold to be in the Rose Garden. Today, he actually got on the road here and spoke at Emanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church uh, in uh, Charleston, South Carolina. Here he is. I want to make it clear. You all made this possible because of your voice. Your voice was heard <clears throat> in shaping your destiny. That's democracy. And I'm proud to have led the effort to make sure your voice, the South Carolina voice, will always be heard because now you're first in the primary. <laughs> Of course, Josh, uh, he remembers South Carolina quite yep. fondly uh, from the last campaign. There are questions about the role South Carolina could play as well on the Republican side with Nikki Haley uh, coming back to her home state. She's trailing Donald Trump by a lot. There have been a lot of concerns, though, about Joe Biden losing progressives, losing black voters who brought him into office to begin with, over discontent about a number of issues, including most recently the situation in Israel. How important is that trip and others like it for him? Yeah, I mean, this trip is clearly aimed at shoring up support among black voters who, you know, Biden credits with delivering him to the White House in the first place. And today we saw some of those tensions come to a head. There was a brief protest in the church, people calling for a ceasefire mm -hmm. and then being shouted over by congregants at the church who were shouting for four more years. I think Biden is very much uh, uh, of the mind always that he sort of, you know, dances with the one that brought him to the ball. And that's yeah. why you're going to see outreach to minority communities, in particular the black community, and that's just going to keep going. You know, he's also been asked about, well, about his own primary. You know, could he get 
sort of lower than expected totals in some of these, and could suddenly this sort of fledgling whispers of you know Dean Phillips or whatever mm. challenger could could there be some you know gas on the fire on mm. that? And they've really downplayed that. They don't seem that concerned about that. What they are concerned about generally is black support, black turnout, not necessarily in South Carolina in the general election, but in other states, swing states with big black populations, making sure that you know they're not losing touch with those communities. I think we're going to see him a lot of, on the road a lot. We're going to see Kamala Harris on the road a lot, mm-hmm. trying to make sure that they shore up those constituencies to combat pretty soft enthusiasm numbers among some cohorts that made up the Biden election. You know, the one person that has like, decided who he thinks is winning Iowa, Joe Biden has decided Donald Trump has mm-hmm. won Iowa already. He's running against him, yeah. essentially, yeah. already. He's jumping the gun a little bit on that. And so we'll see, we'll see where that goes. But right now, they're just really focused on that Trump contrast and trying to put together that sort of, you know, Humpty Dumpty coalition that Biden <laughs> scraped yeah. by with in 2020 and is d- desperate to put together again. Well, one of the issues he's facing, not just in terms of his handling of the conflict between Israel and Hamas and the resulting uh, toll it has taken on Palestine, is something here at home, the economy on the one hand, but border security On the other, Josh, and knowing that the White House actively is negotiating with the Senate, at least at this point, for a border security deal, how badly does Biden, not just as a president, but as a candidate, need to be seen doing something about that? Uh, It recommends, it indicates rather how the uh, situation has changed. I mean, Democrats seem to be entertaining border measures that they wouldn't have entertained all that long ago. uh, And they really have no choice. I mean, I think the Republicans who are negotiating this are in a pretty strong position. Uh, we don't know yet, you know, how this will take shape, if it will take shape. But Biden has has sort of tried to minimize the border. He's been there briefly. Early on, it was Kamala Harris's responsibility mm-hmm. to address migration from Northern Triangle countries. Not so much anymore. The root causes. Right, exactly. And so that this has just been a building issue, and in particular, pressures building among Democratic governors and mayors who are seeing migrants come to their communities without the resources to help settle people in a humane way or an orderly way. And so this is just a growing problem for them. So I think that's why they're suddenly at the table talking about a deal that, that, you know, not that long ago they either wouldn't have considered or wouldn't have considered for long. Interesting polling from CBS News uh, over the weekend specific to the border. And President Biden, 63 percent agree that the president should be tougher on the border. And as we wait for a potential deal to emerge as soon as this week, uh, this is the question of Donald Trump, Nancy. And I wonder what you think about this, knowing that Speaker Johnson's in constant contact with your regular contact with the former president. Why would Donald Trump ever allow for or endorse a deal on the border that would clearly help Joe Biden? Well, I think that he is probably looking at the long game. You know, it's not good for Republicans at this point to appear completely dysfunctional in the House and unable to govern in an election year. That really hurts their prospects on the ballot for the House and the Senate. It does very much seem like Republicans will be able to recapture the Senate. And so I think that they are looking at at it strategically. You have to remember the Trump campaign this time around is very organized and very professional, unlike the way his White House operated. And so I think that they are much better at sort of looking strategically at the long term. Well, you talk about organization within a White House. So, uh, Josh, there's a lot of questions uh, today, really over the last several days, about, I guess, organized communication between the White House and the Pentagon after news came out that the Secretary of Defense, Lloyd Austin, essentially was hospitalized on New Year's Day, and it was days before the White House knew about it. How could that possibly have happened. Does that indicate that, frankly, the Secretary of Defense and the President, for all of the different conflicts going on in the world, don't actually talk to each other that much? I mean, this is a question <laughs> everyone's asking: is how how could this happen? And you know, it was the the administration was pretty quick to sort of throw the DoD under the bus a little yeah, bit here, were. saying we didn't know. It was days Jake Sullivan didn't know the National Security Advisor until I believe Thursday, if memory serves. Uh, but so they, they've sort of kind of conceded that this was a mistake immediately. Now, the next question is, of course, we've got calls about uh, whether he should resign, Secretary Austin should resign, but the White House is on the flip side nipping those in the bud Mm -hmm. so far as saying not only do they not expect it, but uh, there's a report in Politico that he would deny it or uh, decline the offer if if Austin were to make it. So I think Lloyd Austin's going to be around for a while. No president wants to can a a defense secretary in election year. That's not going to be particular with everything that's going on, Mm -hmm. but it's... uh, uh, it's egg on the face. I should say, we still don't know a lot about the circumstances of his health situation. Yes. So people are, in the meantime, even though it seems to be an elective situation, not life-threatening, uh, wishing the secretary a speedy recovery, but asking how is it that there wasn't sort of a middle gap scenario uh, to address the, his, his absence. It's pretty remarkable. We still don't know what it was. 
that brought him to the hospital or what it was beyond severe pain that brought him back. There was an on-the-record, off-camera briefing at the Pentagon today. Mm -hmm. We learned essentially nothing new uh, since this morning. So we'll keep you posted, of course, on the Secretary's condition. Our thanks to Josh Wingrove and Nancy Cook with us at our Bloomberg Roundtable. Coming up as Congress begins to return to Washington, we'll talk to the many hurdles in their way with Congressman French Hill of Arkansas. He's with us next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV. You've got to notice how angry the far right flank of the House GOP is this morning. We need to understand that the speaker, Speaker Johnson, is operating with no room for error, and he will almost certainly need Democratic support to pass his bill. That's something that former Speaker McCarthy didn't want to do, ended up doing, and then got thrown out from the speakership. Isaac Boltanski from BTIG on Bloomberg TV earlier today reflecting on the headaches facing Speaker Mike Johnson in passing a budget in his Republican conference. There is some news there. Joining us now to talk about it, Congressman French Hill of Arkansas. Congressman, welcome back. Happy New Year, if it's not too late to say that. I know we're a week out. But there Thanks, is Jill. news Happy that New we've you and apparently agreed to, thank you, sir, agreed to top-line spending levels for the budgeting process uh, for the fiscal year. I'm a little bit confused, though, Congressman, because it's the same top line level agreed to in the debt ceiling deal going back to June. So did we just waste all that time? Well, I wish it was June. I wish it was warm and sunny outside, but it's cold and rainy here in Little Rock. And you're exactly right. We are exactly where we were in June which is a Fiscal Responsibility Act level of spending that assures the proper defense budget, takes us back to uh, non-defense, non-VA spending, back to FY19 levels. And Speaker Johnson did add some additional wins for the Republican side of the aisle this week because he was able to claw back uh, over $20 billion of additional spending in both uh, COVID spending and that IRS uh, budget for increasing their staff. So uh, we are back there and think of all the things that we could have gotten done. We would have had spending behind us. We'd still have a speaker, Kevin McCarthy, but none of that's to be. But I'm glad yeah. we're here and I hope this can let us get a, a deal done and done quickly. Well, Congressman, you speak of some wins that Mike Johnson is touting now, and it doesn't necessarily seem, though, that everyone is satisfied. The Freedom Caucus said this deal is worse than they thought. What is the likelihood that this can actually pass with enough Republican votes or Mike Johnson's going to need Democrats here? Well, the Freedom Caucus voted before Christmas, Kaylee, to accept the Fiscal Responsibility Act spending levels. So I'm a little frustrated to hear that news today. Speaker Johnson has gotten that deal plus some additional savings. So it's even better than the initial number that uh, Kevin McCarthy uh, negotiated with President Biden. But look, what Speaker Johnson has before him with these levels is how will these spending bills come to the House floor? House Republicans don't want an omnibus spending bill, so we have the January 19th date and the February 2nd date that we have to contend with, even if we have those spending levels. So that's the mission before us right now, and time is of the essence. Well, we're dealing with not a lot of time indeed, eight legislative days. Uh, knowing that the uh, the shutdown would begin at least in part this month, realizing that the bulk of expirations would take place uh, in early February. Uh, but, Congressman, we know that Speaker Johnson may well allow some policy riders here that would be seen as poison pills by Democrats and would bring this whole thing to a halt. So where are we in reality? We just agreed that we're back in June here in our virtual yep. clock. Can this pass, or do you think we're going to shut things down in a couple weeks? Well, this is an important point, and this is what frustrating for me, Joe, and we talked about it before Christmas that Chuck Schumer really didn't get uh, much work done in the Senate. Uh, we've passed seven of the 12 bills across the House floor. They've all gone through committee, and you're exactly right. Now that we have the spending level, we've got to determine what are the policy riders that will be accepted from the legislative work done in the House, how many of those could be accepted in the Senate, 
And that's the hard work now to get this drafted in two pieces mm -hmm. before January 9th and February 2nd. And we don't know till we see the text. And that's, uh, I'm sure, uh, a all night operation for the next few days to get that produced. Well, and one of the policies in question in particular is when it comes to border security. I actually spoke with one of your colleagues, uh, Texas Congressman Chip Roy, about what exactly he was willing to settle for in terms of border policy in order to fund the government. And this is what he told me. Congress should use its power to force change. That's what I'm telling Speaker Johnson and my Republican colleagues to do, to hold the funding and to use it to force a, an administration that is ignoring the law to do their job. I believe that we need to pass H.R. 2 or we need to withhold funding until we get it. Congressman Hill, obviously, H.R. 2 was passed by the House some time ago. It was dead on arrival in the Senate yet, I would imagine it's then. It's, I would imagine it's not that different now. So what will the House settle for if H.R. 2 is a non-starter for the Senate and the White House? Well, I was pleased to go to the border last week with Speaker Johnson. That was my eighth trip to the border, my second trip down to Eagle Pass. And what Chip Roy is saying is true. The ideal set of policy changes are contained in H.R. 2, but we don't have 60 votes for H.R. 2 uh, in the Senate. So my priorities are reforming the definition of credible fear and reforming the asylum process and the catch and release process. These are policy decisions that Joe Biden made on January 20th, 2021. They're not funding decisions per se, they're policy decisions. And what Chip Roy and I definitely agree on is getting our power, the power of the purse to compel policy changes from the president are the most important thing we can do. The question is, will we? how many Republicans will we get? We won't get them all, let's be realistic. We're not going to get every Republican to support uh, these efforts. But Joe Biden recognizes that he has to do something to correct his failing, fledgling policies on the border. Uh, and you hear that from Democrat mayors, you hear it from Democratic senators. So he knows he has a political problem and this is a top priority for Republicans in the House. So I hope, there's credible compromise available here to get this done. And it'll be just a Dr. step Will forward to solve it. the whole problem. Realizing, yes, that it might not be something you'd call comprehensive congressman. We talked to Will no. Hurd about that, former Texas Republican congressman, former Republican presidential candidate, uh, and former CIA official who's had very uh, strong feelings about all of this. He talked to me on Bloomberg Radio about the situation at the border, having represented a border district. Here's what he said. The border is is continuing to be a crisis i'm always going to be hopeful that something gets done because the communities uh, uh, along the border have been suffering for for five years so what should our viewers and listeners expect here congressman to your point we're talking about a massive issue what some call the third rail we've been working on it for more than 20 years and it hasn't right. happened is it time to temper expectations on what a final product might look like well, look, President Trump struggled through this in his four years in office, and he finally got uh, a bit of a balance before he left office, and that was the Remain in Mexico policy, the enforcement of the credible fear standard at the border. Joe Biden's had 7.1 million encounters in three years. He's allowed 3.3 million people to be in the country illegally under a uh, work permit waiting for an asylum hearing. And that is, I think, at the core of what drives these caravans to the border is the promise that you can come into the U.S., stay waiting for an asylum hearing, hearing. maybe you can get a job, maybe you can stay, and we don't enforce the existing law. That would cut down on the flow. 300,000 people in December alone, the largest number of people crossing illegally in, in 20 years. So I hear you. But we know what we need to do to improve the border, and that's reform this asylum process, catch and release process, mm -hmm. and the credible fear standard. I think Will Hurd would agree with that. Chip Roy would agree with it. And unfortunately, we've had no leadership from President Biden or his Homeland Security Secretary Mayorkas in the past three years on this. They've just truly turned their back on this topic. All right, Congressman, we have to leave it there. But thank you so much for joining us and safe Great travels back to back. Washington. That is Republican Congressman from Arkansas, French Hill. Coming up, speaking of travel, shares of Boeing are lower today after a blowout that caused a large piece of a plane to fall off midair. We'll have more next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV.
Airlines. That was the Alaska Airlines Flight 1282 on Saturday, a sound you don't want to hear on an airplane. Boeing taking steps toward returning its grounded 737 MAX 9 jetliners to service after a piece of a plane blew off midair. Joining us now for more is George Ferguson, senior aerospace defense and airline analyst for Bloomberg Intelligence. George, thanks so much for being here. We have news now this afternoon that United has found loose bolts in multiple 737 MAX jets as it's inspecting them. Just how far do you think this problem will extend. How long will these planes stay grounded? Well, so, you know, there's about, there's a little bit over 200 of these airplanes in service. And so it can't go too far. I think on the 737-8, uh, you don't have this situation where you're plugging one of the emergency exits if you, if you um, don't have a high density configuration. So it can only be those 200 and some airplanes. Uh, it is concerning this United news. It, it, it tells me that Someone on the line systemically, we think it's probably on the manufacturing line, systemically is not, you know, is not uh, fastening things down correctly, which is concerning. But, you know, again, it goes back to, uh, you know, Boeing and Spirit, especially at Spirit, they need to be, there needs to be better supervision on the line, better training to make sure employees know exactly what they need to do in manufacturing uh, these airframes. Incredible luck that no one was sitting in the seat next to yes. what became a gaping hole in the side of the plane next to that plug, George. I have to ask you what everybody's thinking. What would have happened if someone had been there? Well, I mean, I think it depends on whether or not you're belted in or not, right? And I think that when we all fly, uh, they tell us to stay belted in when, uh, when you're not up and moving around the cabin. Uh, I think Move now forward. you know one reason why. Um, you know, so, yeah, I think that's... George, we only have about a minute left, but just quickly, how how financially material is this going to be for Boeing? Yeah, so when we do the analysis, we you know we think that the biggest cost is going to be remuneration to the airlines for airplanes being out of service, and so our, our analysis mm -hmm. based on Alaska profitability uh, and labor costs because essentially the airlines ought to be compensated for lost profitability and labor. You can't sort of send labor home because an airplane isn't flying. We think it's probably about $5 million a day for all 225 airplanes uh, that are out of service. Not a lot of money, reputational, more of a challenge here, I think. George, thank you and great reporting. George Ferguson with Bloomberg Intelligence. As we read on the terminal now, Boeing's already making moves to try to get around this, Kaylee, issuing guidance to airlines on the inspections required following a mid-air failure. This is Bloomberg. I am very worried that we will be a very different country that cannot rely on the rule of law and take it for granted as we traditionally have uh, if we experience a second uh, Trump administration. Former U.S. Treasury Secretary and Wall Street Week contributor Larry Summers talking about his fears for the 2024 presidential election. And speaking of 2024, Eurasia Group has released its list of the top global risks this year. And at the very top, the United States versus itself. Joining us now is Cliff Chupkin. Uh, Cupchin. He is the CEO of Eurasia Group. So, Cliff, the United States versus itself doesn't exactly sound like a ringing endorsement of the American democratic process in the year 2024. What exactly do you mean by this? We mean that look, as soon as Donald Trump gets the endorsement, the, the, the nomination of his party, this country is going to turn into two halves. He is going to control the agenda. He's going to get the money. He's going to get the TV. He's going to start to set the agenda. And then the country's at war with itself, as far as we're concerned. The campaign's going to be ugly. You have indictment versus uh, impeachment. You have two old guys that nobody really wants to run. It's going to be very ugly. Democratic institutions are already eroding in this country. Hmm. And they're going to start eroding very quickly, I think, after the campaign starts heating up. Well, let's walk a little further down that path here, because I'm curious what you have in mind. We've been hearing uh, references to the Civil War on the campaign trail. Donald Trump over the weekend in Iowa, you know, Nikki Haley was asked mm -hmm. about that. Of course, uh, how far does this go 
before we're having that conversation again in modern history? I think we'll be having the conversation very soon, as soon as he gets the civil nomination war. again. I think the civil war, I think, is a bit over the top. American institutions, you know, these guys that created this country were really smart. Yeah. I think they got human greed right. They put these three, you know, checks and balances yep. together so it can't go too far. Can this country take four more years of Donald Trump? We, you know, we, we may find out. I think on balance, yeah, but we're going to come up pretty badly bruised after that. So I wouldn't go to civil war. I think that's a, kind of a good soundbite. I don't think it's really accurate yet. Mm -hmm. But I, I think we better really be careful what, you know, what happens starting, you know, starting in March and all the way through November. So is the greater risk in your mind Trump winning the 2024 election or him not winning in 2024 and much like 2020 casting doubt yeah. on whether the democratic it's, process it, worked? It, as the electoral did. contact, there's legislation now that makes him a lot, it's a lot harder to go back and try to revisit. Plus, as you know, in the midterms, all, you know, the secretaries of state that were election deniers, they all lost. Mm -hmm. So I, I think going after, you know, steel again is going to be really hard. So I think Trump winning is the election. But I got to say, you know, when I look at the numbers, if the election were held today, I'd go, kind of go 60-40. Not a lot of confidence in that call, but 60-40 Trump. I think he's got the edge right now. The uh, greater risk is if he wins, then what do we get? He appoints loyalists. He kind of makes the civil service into a political service to fire the people he doesn't like. Mm -hmm. Then he could convert, probably would convert the DOJ, the Department of Justice, and the FBI into political institutions and go after his enemies and the Bidens. I mean, wow. people in the Biden administration, some of whom I've talked to, are not scared that they're going to be in jeopardy, yeah. personal jeopardy, their families, if well, Trump he wins. he said himself that he would indict mm -hmm. Joe Biden if reelected, using language that I can't use here on the air. Yeah. Um, but Cliff, when we look down the list, number mm -hmm. two, Middle East on the brink, a partitioned Ukraine is three. Both of those directly involve the United States at this point, don't they? Well, they do. And we, and we make the point that very good allies of the United States, Israel and Ukraine, because of the belief system of their leaders, could drag this country into wars that we really, really don't want you know, more, more a part of here. Uh, Bibi Netanyahu, some think, I think wag the dog, you know, even with Netanyahu is a little pushing it, but he may want to keep the war going to stay out of jail. Yeah, credible, okay. And if he gets into a war with Iran or Hezbollah, boom, I think, you know, we're, we're kind of in. Ukraine, the Black Sea is a tinderbox. If something goes wrong in the Black Sea, and it could be right now, Ukraine is exporting grain very cleverly around the border, you know, around Bulgaria, Romania, the Bosphorus. If you, the Russians, and they're debating this, sink a ship there, we could have an international crisis and War at sea can escalate very quickly. So we're, we're, we're kind of exposed on both counts. Well, I want to talk about the Middle East some more, as that is yep. your number two risk on the yep, list sure. this year. And this is actually something that Secretary of State Antony Blinken, while in the region, spoke about, talking about this idea of escalation. Take mm -hmm. a listen. It's clearly not in the interest of anyone, Israel, Lebanon, Hezbollah, for that matter, uh, to, see this, uh, to see this escalate and to see an actual conflict. And the Israelis have been very clear with us that they want to find a diplomatic way forward. The U.S. has been pushing this idea that they would not like to see this escalate into a broader regional conflict. It seems like we get closer and closer every day if you just look at the developments in the headlines. What mm -hmm. does a broader regional conflict, though, actually mean? What is it most likely to look like, knowing that there's Iran, Iranian proxies, but other Arab allies in this conversation as well? Now, the most likely way we get there, and I think what it would look like if we see it, is Israel attacks Hezbollah or Hezbollah attacks Israel. Once we get there, then Iran's, Iran's main proxy, the resistance front's you know, crown jewel, is in play. And they're not going to let it get worn down very far before, before they come in. Iran directly. Iran directly, right. And then we have Iran more in the war, IRGC troops, Iran Revolutionary Guard Corps troops in Lebanon. At the same time, if Israel gets pressed by Hezbollah and Iran, the U.S. is in. I think the U.S. is in anyway if Israel and Hezbollah get mixed up with air support from the carriers. So that could escalate very quickly. The one I think we might read about in coming weeks, though, much sooner, is, is I think I'd be, I'd be surprised if the U.S. didn't hit the Houthis mm. sooner rather than later. It's an accident waiting to happen. Now, yeah. the Houthis aren't as close to Iran as Hezbollah is, so there's a little bit more play there before we get into real trouble. Mm -hmm. But it, it, it gets messy. You've been gaming out some pretty horrifying scenarios here for that, uh, yeah. at <laughs> your Asia group. You, you sure do, Cliff. I, number three, back to Ukraine. A yeah. partitioned Ukraine, as you put it. 
Um, we're going to learn at some point in the coming weeks whether a border deal emerges, emerges in Washington and whether you funding, funding yeah. will follow. Yeah. If that does not happen, does that number three, a partitioned Ukraine, become more likely? Well, let me first say that, that, that we say things as we see them. We don't like them as much as anybody else does. I mean, I, I think Ukraine is going in a bad direction right now. First off, even if, if we get another big appropriation this year for Ukraine, mm -hmm. I think it's likely to be the last big appropriation for the United States. If Trump wins, forget it. Yeah. But we've seen what happens, even if, if you have a Democratic president, and let's say we get a Democratic sweep. Not going to happen. If you get a Democratic sweep, we've seen the movie. It's really hard to get money for Ukraine now. So I think Ukraine is, is probably not going to get much more than this appropriation. Ukraine, the material balance, Russia's doing better on missiles, on manpower. Russia's on the offensive in Donetsk Oblast. The, I think Ukraine's got to turn around this year. They've got to stop the infighting in the government. They've got to scale up weapons production. Or I think next year we could talk about Ukraine beginning to lose. Well, lose meaning having to accept an unfavorable armistice where they give up more land. Now, I don't like that. I'm an American. I don't like that. But It's a global it, risk. Well, you we, you know, we call it as we see it. That's, that's what that is. Fascinating conversation and a scary one. Uh, Cliff Kupchin, we thank you for being with us. Thanks for having me. From Eurasia Group, joining us here at the table. We want to add the voice now of Howard Buffett, the founder and CEO of the Howard G. Buffett Foundation, which has invested more than $500 million in Ukraine since Russia's invasion. Mr. Buffett, welcome to Bloomberg. You're just back from your 10th visit, I believe, to Ukraine. And we know that the bombing continues. We know it was a violent weekend as Russia continues to lean in this winter, what is life like on the ground? It's really tough. Um, you know, when I left there January 2nd, uh, Russia had started a real serious bombing campaign, which they've not ended yet. Uh, you're seeing more civilians dying, and, and including children. Uh, you know, this is part of the Russian strategy, which is to wear people down, uh, to, to create fatigue. And, of course, that will work to some degree, but there are still um, there's still a, an incredible commitment by the Ukrainian people and, and, and the soldiers on the front line. Um, they are, you know, they're not giving up. They, they understand they're fighting for their freedom. They're, they're fighting for their life. They're fighting for democracy. Um, and they know they can't give up. Well, they may not give up, but there is a question, Howard, as we were just discussing with Cliff, whether or not the U.S. is going to give up on this cause, at least in terms of providing monetary and military funding. What happens in Ukraine if the U.S. has given already all it's going to give? Well, it, it may be that the U.S. stops temporarily. And what I mean by that is if Ukraine falls, um, they'll be on the doorstep of uh, many other European countries uh, Putin's very clever and he has patience, so it doesn't mean it'll move right away, but at some point he's going to make a, additional moves. He said he's going to do it. His generals have said he's going to do it. You look at Putin's history, you have to believe he's going to do it. So at that point, uh, NATO will get engaged. For people who say that we can step out of NATO are very unrealistic about our future. I mean, Ukraine is fighting not just the second uh, most powerful military in the world, but they're also fighting really by proxy Iran and North Korea. So, so Ukraine is fighting three of our largest enemies at this point in time. And if that isn't enough to get our attention and keep our attention, uh, we will do it without choice when, when they get to Europe's doorstep and, and we will be fighting as part of Ukraine. And if we withdraw from Ukraine, we have no allies and no friends in the world when we come to having to fight or deal with another conflict. Howard, I know you've focused a lot of your work on food insecurity around the globe and including uh, Ukraine. You can't have one without the other. As we learned in the initial invasion by Russia, the inflation that we saw and the food shortages that other parts of the world experienced. Cliff uh, Kupchin just spelled out great worries about what could take place in the Black Sea. And I wonder how concerned you are, how real the threat is against the food supply chain in Ukraine were that to happen? Well, it's been, you know, significantly uh, affected now. I mean, I would say that, um, you know, Ukraine is down by 50 percent of their production. They have 20 percent of their country, almost 20 percent of their country occupied by Russia, which has a large part of their agricultural uh, production areas. 
And so um, I don't know how much worse it gets, but if they escalate, uh, if Russia escalates in the Black Sea, uh, it's hard to tell uh, what happens. But, but it all comes down to how the U.S. responds and Europe responds. And I think, you know, if you start listening to, you know, Hungary is an outlier, but if, if you start listening to the other foreign ministers uh, and prime ministers in most European countries, they understand how serious this is and how significant it can be for them. And they need the United States as an ally, and we're going to need them in the future. So we, we are in this one way or the other. Well, something you hear often, Howard, in Congress from those who are more hesitant or resistant to the idea of providing further aid to Ukraine is this idea of accountability, of making sure the funds are used appropriately as intended. In your work there, in, including with the funds you are providing, have you seen evidence that perhaps there is misuse happening? No. And, you know, a lot of people like to use that argument. And there's been uh, almost no uh, credible proof of how it's been misused. Of course, in a war, you're always going to have some things get used, uh, you know, inappropriately. But, you know, the most important thing, this narrative just never gets repeated, is, you know, if you go back to Blinken's uh, December 20th, I think it was, uh, press conference just, you know, not even a month ago, he made the point that 90 percent of all of the military uh, assistance that we're providing is in the United States. This what, what we're doing is supporting thousands of jobs across 31 states in this country in the defense industry. And so none of that money is misappropriated. It's all here in the United States. Some money is going, of course, for other purposes. But I can tell you that the people uh, that we deal with, the ministers we deal with, uh, you know, they are stand up people. They are trying to do the best job that they can do in an incredibly difficult situation. I trust the Ukrainian people. Uh, is there a problem with corruption? Of course, there's a problem with corruption in, in, in the country. And the president's doing his best to address it at a very difficult time. So I, I have confidence that uh, the support that the United States gives to Ukraine, the far majority, uh, almost all of it, is going where it's supposed to go and doing what it's supposed to do. You can't have 100 percent when you're fighting a war. It's not going to be perfect. The people of Iowa are going to start voting a week from today. Howard, as we begin the process of selecting a Republican nominee, a lot of folks think already that will be Donald Trump. What would that mean for this entire conversation moving forward? Well, um, it's 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 a little uh, concerning if he does everything that he says he's going to do. I mean, you know, he says he can end the war in 24 hours. I'm not sure he's never defined what that means. Uh, yeah. And it can mean different things. But I don't know how you end the war in 24 hours and have Ukraine come out in a very good position. Uh, he has talked about withdrawing from NATO. Um, you know, I, sometimes a lot, a lot of politicians say things that they aren't going to do, so I can't judge that. Um, but if we withdraw from NATO, we'll have some significant issues in the near future uh, when we need allies and we need friends. We won't have any. So I, I think, you know, uh, I, would, I would defer to see what he actually does do because, you know, actions speak louder than words. But... Um, it's 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 a concern in terms of Ukraine. All right, Howard, we have to leave it there. But thank you so much for joining us this evening. That's Howard Buffett of the Howard Buffett Foundation. But coming up, as Joe just mentioned, the Iowa caucuses are only a week away. We'll be joined by our political panel to discuss what to look forward to and what it all means. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV. I think the, the choice on the 15th is clear. Uh, Donald Trump is running for his issues. Nikki Haley's running for her donors' issues. I'm running for your issues. I have read all the things that they're saying. And these fellows are just spending so much time on me, and it's really sweet of them. But if you look at every one of those, every single thing, every commercial Ron has put up there, has been a lie. 
That was Florida Governor Ron DeSantis and former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley over the weekend as the pressure mounts one week ahead of the Iowa caucuses. Joining us now with more is our political panel, Rick Davis, partner at Stone Court Capital, and Jeannie Shanzano, political science professor at Iona University. So, Rick, we are one week out. How much realistically can change for Ron DeSantis or Nikki Haley within the span of a week when Donald Trump is still polling roughly around 50 percent? Yeah, well, first of all, you have to always give the Iowa caveat that Iowa loves to surprise people like us. <laughs> <laughs> we love those polls. They sound so dramatic. And then Iowa goes and upsets the apple cart. So will Iowa upset the apple cart? I would say probably not, because uh, the group that usually does it is the evangelical community. They're usually very homogeneous. They all work in mass, and it's probably half the caucus goers uh, who attend caucuses in Iowa. But this time they're split. And they're split between Ron DeSantis and Donald Trump. And that takes away some of the impact that they could have, especially in a surprise move like, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, Donald Trump having a closer than otherwise expected. The real question I have is, can Donald Trump actually win every single county in Iowa? Mm -hmm. Because if you're at 50 percent, you're looking at a sweep. Mm -hmm. Wow. Incredible. Uh, uh, Jeannie, you know, the, the saying, uh, Iowa picks corn, New Hampshire picks presidents. Would that be different this time? If Donald Trump wins the Iowa caucuses, will he be the nominee? Um, he, he could be. He'd be well on his way. And of course, the last correct pick that Iowa made, who became president on the Republican side, was George W. Bush. And just to build on what Rick was talking about, one of the things that George Bush had in 2000 when he did that, he had the support of evangelicals and the more traditional, moderate, independent, if you will, wing of the Republican Party. And the winners who have won, you know, 08, you know, 12, 16, since then, they have had more of the support of the evangelicals so they could win Iowa but not carry it through. And one of the things that's unique about Trump here is he has grown his support among evangelicals enormously since 2016. And so I think the evangelical vote here is going to be critical. But, you know, Donald Trump also has to be careful, and we're hearing it from his campaign and from Donald Trump, because is this going to be a case where winning is losing? In other words, he wins, but he doesn't win by such big margins. And so we've heard them out saying things like, well, the largest majority in Iowa was Bob Dole in 1988 at 12 points. So if we beat that, we're good to go. Yeah, yeah. but you're up 30 points right now. So, you know, he does have the expectations issue to contend with. And that's just in Iowa. Obviously, the question for a candidate like Nikki Haley is, can you put up a strong enough second place showing, maybe get in a margin of 12 and a half percent or what have you to carry that through New Hampshire and then potentially to your home state of South Carolina? And yet, Jeannie, looking at the latest Emerson poll, Trump, 54 percent, Haley, 25 percent in South Carolina. If she can't even win at home, are we talking about her really as a serious contender? You know, I think it depends largely on what happens in Iowa. Does she come in a closer than expected second? And then, of course, New Hampshire. If she is able to come in close or indeed beat Trump and she is narrowing the gap there, she could get momentum into South Carolina. But I've been watching and Trump is hitting her increasingly. He's using Ron DeSantis and Vivek Ramaswamy's line that she is bought and sold by the donors. She's not a real Republican, that she is a liar. She's a flip-flopper. She came to Mar-a-Lago and promised not to run against him, and oops, then she did. You can't trust her. So he is starting to hit her hard, and you can bet she comes in close in Iowa and closer or beats him in New Hampshire, the race is going to be on right to her home state, and she's going to have a race on her hands against Trump there. Well, while we're talking South Carolina, that is in fact where Joe Biden was today, president leaving the Beltway, and went to South Carolina to deliver a speech, this visit as part of an effort to secure more black voters in this campaign. Let's listen. It's because of this congregation and the black community of South Carolina, and not an exaggeration and Jim Clyburn, that I stand here today as your president because of all of you. That's a fact. You know, Rick Davis, uh, we've talked about his challenges here with black voters and the work that he will have to do uh, that's been made more difficult by the situation in Israel. But he's talking about Donald Trump at the podium right now as if he's already the nominee. Is yeah. that the right strategy? Joe, I think you have to expect that every speech that he gives, either as candidate Biden or as President Biden, is going to include an attack on Donald Trump. They've made a calculation, 
and probably not a bad one, mm-hmm. that um, they're going to be running against Donald Trump and they're going to start uh, positioning him vis-a-vis all these constituencies. Um, I would note it was kind of interesting at the very start of that speech, uh, he had a little protest movement there mm-hmm. inside right. the church, Speaking you know, Israel. attacking to him about, like, let's have a uh, ceasefire in the Middle East. So uh, he's going to have that haunting him everywhere he goes. And so he's in a mode now where everything he does is going to be a political speech, regardless of whether it's an official presidential campaign speech, mm-hmm. a official presidential speech or a campaign speech. Well, and it's black voters, it's Hispanic voters, Jeannie, it's young voters as well. Obviously, overarchingly, we know that Biden has an economy issue. But if you look at the protesters at the speech today, frankly, look at his approval numbers on the border, which are kind of abysmal, more than 60 percent disapprove of his handling of that issue. What's his biggest problem with his core demographics right now? You know, I think there are several things. One is Israel. Um, You know, his core constituency, you know, just look at black voters. We saw in the six swing states Donald Trump getting 22 percent of support amongst black voters. That's enormous. In in 2020, he won eight. And in 2016, he was at six percent. So that is an enormous problem for the Democrats if that was to, you know, live itself out. And I think that's why we've seen the president out on Friday in, you know, Valley Forge and then today. Mm -hmm down in Charlottesville trying to make or Charleston trying to make this case to black voters and connecting it to not just the shooting, but connecting a line directly to the MAGA Donald Trump movement. And I want to just note, he didn't only hit Donald Trump in this speech, he also hit Nikki Haley, interestingly, on her comments about yeah, on the, the Civil, Civil War. War. Yes, yeah. Right. <laughs> Keeps well, coming up, Joe. Yeah, it does keep coming up. Uh, a reality check from Rick Davis, 12 below zero. On caucus day, does that impact turnout? Oh, yeah. Balmy day like that in (laughs) Iowa. I mean, everybody's going to show up. (laughs) Well, you are, and Jeannie is, and we are, too, and we're looking forward to that. (laughs) One week away. Rick and Jeannie, thank you for getting us started this week. And check out the Washington Edition newsletter on the terminal and online. Thanks so much for joining us on Ballots of Power. We'll be back here tomorrow at 5 p.m. Eastern time, right here on Bloomberg.